first I came across Adib um, on Instagram, um, and I was immediately taken aback by his work. There is a push and pull in his work because the images are difficult of situations that are difficult, but they're also beautiful. Um, and so I was mesmerized and thought, I really want to know how he does his magic. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Adib. Thank you very much. Wow, okay. Thanks for that last track, Lemsi, because honestly, I was so chilled after your first one, I thought I was going to fall asleep. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, I know it's super early on a Friday morning, so thanks very much for being here. I'm going to talk a little bit about, of course, the theme of now and how photography relates to that theme um, and, but I want to interpret it a little bit more broadly, so I want to talk about how this weird time that we're in at the moment, you know, we're coming out of a very weird global pandemic. Some people are at various stages of that transition, of coming outside of that, so they might still be, you know, isolating themselves a bit, um, and we're all at different journeys of that. For me, I've only sort of just started coming out of um, isolation. I moved myself to London a few months ago. Um, and yeah, I think the thing is coming back to a little bit of normal, um, at least for me, and I hope it is for you. Um, so I wanted to talk about how that weird time of quarantine that we've all been through for the last, how long has it been, like two years now? Um, for me, it was really a moment of reflection in the work that I had done. Um, and it's also guided me in a whole new direction as to where my work is going to go. Previously, I was very oriented on the kind of traditional photojournalism. And as I reflected through my archives, I began to notice some recurring themes and patterns, um, which I want to talk to you all a little bit more about now. So just to give a little brief introduction, um, I focused on conflict, particularly looking at uh, post-conflict societies. So how people themselves as individuals would heal after conflict, the trauma that they felt, how they would discuss that with their families, and how society comes together to, to recover from that. Um, I also covered human rights, which is a very broad umbrella. Um, I looked at the issues of identity and of environmental issues. So I'll show you a few of the photos that I've taken from... This is from a period of... Um, I really started in 20, when did I start? 2015, um, all the way until uh, now. So here we go. So this is the first project I did. Um, I'd been studying about refugee issues for the last four years before this, um, but from a very strictly academic sense, I focused on international relations, so I got my degree in, and then I focused my master's degree specifically looking at conflict. Um, I had no formal training in photography, and I got into photography when I was 16, um, absolutely fell in love with the idea of politics on one hand and my creative side, and my love for photography on the other hand, and the two just merged together. And photojournalism was something that I had, I'd been interested in it since I was 16, but I never really had gone out to go and do it until I was, so I started shooting this after my degree when I was, when I was 20, uh, I think I was 23 at the time. So this uh, was in Lesbos, in Greek, in uh, a Greek island, sorry, um, very close to Turkey. And this is at the time when, this was taken just uh, two or three weeks after that, um, very moving photo of Ilan Kurdi appeared. I don't know, most of you probably still remember that image. Um, so a lot of refugees were still coming over from Syria at that time and making these dangerous crossings. Um, so this was in Greece, and I ended up following this group of refugees, which were mainly Iraqi, Afghan, and of course Syrian, as they made their journey across Europe. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. It was my first photography project, and I thought, you know what, like, I just handed in my dissertation. Um, I've got a little bit of time before I have anything planned, AKA I was desperately looking for a job. Um, and so I just, yeah, I went to Greece with two friends and then we made the journey through Europe following this group of refugees um, until they finally settled in Germany. And it was a very shocking and eye-opening time for me. Uh, I think a lot of us who have grown up here are told, you know, Europe is a bastion of human rights. Um, and it was a very eye-opening time for me because I began to realize the reality of the situation of when you come into a country fleeing war and just how some of these countries actually 
would treat you. Um, but I won't delve too much into that. I've got other photos to show. So that project, I call it beginner's luck, um, got a, uh, a gave, basically I got awarded a grant, which let me do two other projects. And the one after that, I decided to photograph. This is in Bangladesh. It's in a leather tannery. Um, this whole small village um, is actually floating. It's made of discarded leather. Um, it's a leather tannery. And so H&M and Zara, they um, basically get, they source their leather from this particular area. And I wanted to go and focus on the human toll that took place there. Um, a lot, as you can see, this blue stuff that you see right in front of you here, this is called chromium. Chromium is banned in many, many countries. It's a known carcinogen. It's a fact. It gives you cancer if you come into contact with it. Um, but Bangladesh allows this to happen because it's so dependent on textiles and cheap leather goods, the push and the pull of the market. And this links into a broader theme that I wanted to explore, which is about how basically Bangladesh has essentially become um, a factory, and even its people have become commodities to be outsourced into the world as a form of cheap labor. Um, you can see here, I mean, the guy's just wearing sandals. There's no adherence to any kind of welfare or safety for these workers. And in fact, it's so bad that the, the average lifespan of people who live in and around this area is just 51. Um, people get affected by cancer and all sorts of um, stuff from coming into contact with this horrible stuff. So think about the clothes you buy, guys. Um, this is, at first hand, it looks like a nice picture, right? It's kids playing around being kids. Um, but if you look closely, they're actually playing on the discarded leather piles, which I said. And these leather piles, they contain trace residue levels of chromium. So they're just rolling around playing in it, but they're actually picking up residue of this, the effects of which will probably be felt in their lives in two decades' time. Um, this story is something that I'm going to continue. I'm interested in Bangladesh. I should probably have said uh, my parents are from Bangladesh. Big up to anyone who's also from there. Um, and I, so I've always been going back and forth, looking at environmental issues and human rights issues there. So this is an ongoing project, and I want to look at it more wider into how Bangladesh becoming a, basically, like I said, a factory has affected the people who live there um, so much, and how the world views Bangladesh as well, and basically the dark side of capitalism. A year later, I found myself back in Bangladesh. This is when the Rohingya crisis had happened. Um, Rohingya are a minority who live in Burma, and they faced a lot of persecution from the government. Um, and eventually, there's a whole history to it. I really do recommend you read up. And um, to the point where a mass migration um, happened in 2017. So I went to go and document that. Again, I didn't have any plans, and I was desperately looking for a job. Um, and then the crisis happened, and you know, Bangladesh is home to me. I had been told by my parents all these stories of um, in the independence war that happened. and this long stream of people who would flee the country from the border, go into India, flee out of India. Um, and when this crisis happened, it really, it really brought back a lot of memories of the stories that I had been told about that particular dark period of time. Um, and it was just very, very, very moving time. Um, I had no plans. I rocked up there um, just because I got told I had an uncle who could give me a place to stay. Um, and then I ended up making contact with the Human Rights Watch a monitor who was there, and together, him and I, we traveled across the border in the first few days of this crisis happening. And again, it was a truly, truly shocking time. Um, again, yeah, this is, this is also in the, in the same period of time. This is just the, so uh, that river is actually the border, like just across that is Burma. Um, and I mean, if you look at this photo, things seem kind of calm. Um, but this is something I'm gonna talk about in a little bit later. Um, but what was happening here, if you see that plume of smoke, that was actually the Burmese military. We heard gunshots, um, so we went over to the border to just go and see what was happening. There were people running towards us, and we could just hear them setting, shooting and then setting fire to, to the villagers. So a year after that, oh no, this is also the distribution um, of local councils came together to distribute aid, whether it was clothes or food. Um, there was no distribution process because the local interna well, the international aid agencies hadn't arrived yet, and so there was no organized way of distributing this stuff. And so local councils were just essentially getting giant trucks and throwing the stuff out, and the scene was so chaotic. I mean, you can see it here. It looks like an, 
It felt like an insane mosh pit, and it was absolutely horrible. I mean, you've got people trying to climb onto the vehicle itself, and these guys who are distributing the stuff are having to literally, physically beat their hands down. That's how bad the situation was. It was really horrendous. A year after that, um, less than a year after that, actually, I moved to Lebanon. I wanted to uh, carry on looking at the issues of human rights and particularly looking at refugees. And of course, the Syrian conflict was raging at the time. It still is ongoing. It's not shown that much on the media. It's kind of fallen by the wayside, but it's still ongoing. And it's worth monitoring and, keep and remembering that, I think, in light of the recent other events, which may have overshadowed that. Um, this is a nice story I did. This is about a refugee football team. And um, they consist of Iraqi refugees, Syrian refugees, um, and Palestinians coming together to create a football team. I pitched this story, and I got a shooter as well, as well as a right. And it was, it was a really happy moment for me. It was nice to look at migration issues from a positive kind of side. Um, and then I went, uh, this is, I also covered the Bangladeshi side, um, stories in, in Lebanon. So this is looking at migrant domestic workers. Uh, who lived there at the time. It's often an unheard of story, but migrant domestic workers face a lot of abuse in, the, in this country, in Lebanon, and in, um, around the wider Gulf region as well. It's not just about them making football stadiums and then um, being treated poorly. There's a lot more depth to the, stor uh, to the story and the, the framework surrounding that. But anyway, I want to talk a little bit more um, about practical stuff. I don't want to just show you loads and loads of photos. You can look at my website if you want to do that. But I want to talk about collaboration, reflection, and the last thing is about smashing labels to get yourself out of any kind of creative rut that you might find yourself in. Um, collaboration really came about, um, I don't know if you guys remember, do you remember in lockdown 1.0, the very first lockdown, there was a wave of Instagram lives that were happening. And it was, it was really an exciting time, um, I mean, aside from the context, obviously, being in lockdown, the whole world being in a <laughs> lockdown. But it was an exciting time in the sense that there was a real cross-pollination of different kind of ideas. People who I had looked up to for years were talking to other people and just letting everyone in. There was no kind of paywall that you had to pay. Everyone was in it and was sharing ideas. And I think that this is a very, very important thing to remember. And I hope that people kind of hold on to it and they carry it forward, because it's only through collaboration that you really look at things in a different kind of perspective. And I think the, the lockdown kind of weird period that that was, one of the benefits, the very few benefits, was that it really allowed um, to look at, take a reflection and take stock of your work and to see new avenues for, for kind of growth. So for me, a moment of, um, of kind of revelation really came about when I was talking to um, there's this really good Indian, very, very talented Indian author called Anchal Malhotra, and she's written a book called Remnants of Partition. And what I love about her work is she talks about the partition period, um, you know, when the British left India. And she, what she did was she talked to loads of families who had carried over with them objects from when they fled their homes. These were small little tiny things like a necklaces, or it could even be a little bit, bit of jewelry that they had taken with them, or like pots from their kitchen, small little things, and she photographed them, and she then used that to then explore the wider story around it, what the story was behind it, all these kind of broken pieces of broken history and broken families um, coming together, and it was really eye-opening. And she wrote a second book, and for that second book, she actually interviewed me. And when she interviewed me, she, you know, we started talking about my family's uh, memories of partition time, and we spoke about the topic of silence, because in my family, it's a very oral kind of tradition in, in Bengali history. A lot of stuff is spread through relatives. No one really writes these things down. So it's a very oral tradition. And unfortunately, when people die, um, sometimes they carry the stories with them, and these things get lost. And in my family, there was a real kind of silence around this period of time. And I was frustrated. I, I was talking to her, Anchal, and saying, you know, I'm a little bit frustrated about the fact that we don't have this recorded anywhere. It's not written down anywhere. And it's that moment of silence that we have in our family history that really it frustrates me. It makes me feel sad. It's a whole mixture of emotions. And during the lockdown period, like a lot of people, I was talking to Lemzi about this, you know, I started meditating and I really started thinking internally about what it was that really drew me to all these kind of 
crazy places because you know I was speaking to my friends and they're like well you are a little bit mad like you're studying the stuff but like with little money that you save you go off to like a refugee camp for your Christmas holiday it's not a normal thing to do there's something deeper in there and when I started looking at it and reflecting it Anchal said something to me and she, she said it with a little smile she goes it makes sense the stuff that you photograph because you talk about that silence being a real kind of focal point in your own personal history and she said that she could see it in the moments that I had photographed. And I then went back through my archive. And as creatives, I really recommend you all to actually try and do this. Just look back at the work you've done. Think about your life trajectory and all the, you know, the crazy moments, the sad moments, the very dark moments, and the, also the happy moments that happened, and see how that's reflected in your work. Because I argue that photography is, in fact, not just about being, yes, there's that element of it being very mindful. You have to be present in the moment see the way the light is shining on people and then see the darkness and the composition, all that stuff. But also, it's more a projection, I would argue, of what's going on within yourself, and that's being reflected outwards. And so that's when all these kind of recurring themes start appearing. So when I was looking at my archive and I took into mind what she had said, I started to look back. And that moment, that idea of silence being something that I wanted to explore really became apparent to me. And I was thinking about it, and if you look at all, I photographed these, you know, crazy moments of incredible, like, sort of turmoil going on in the context of what was happening. But all of my photographs have that same kind of thing. I was drawn to moments of silence. So, like, in this photo, um, this is actually a crazy scene. There was, a, you can't see it obviously here, but in the wider context, you need to imagine, there were trucks of refugees going back into Syria, fleeing Lebanon, because in that particular village in Lebanon, they'd faced a very harsh time, and the border was open to them for a small period of, of time. And people were torn. They weren't sure whether they wanted to return back because they would face an unknown future. They weren't sure the Syrian government would, um, would you know, uh, seek revenge on them, essentially. Um, or the situation was so bad that they actually faced a worse situation if they stayed in Lebanon. And in this particular time, I caught these two soldiers. They were just chilling. They were actually just having a nice chat, having a smoke, and relaxing. And for whatever reason, they let this guy go by behind them. But before that, if you were there, they were being extremely strict about who's going back and forth. And again, this is another moment of silence that I caught. Um, there was a lot of anger at this. This was a funeral. There was a lot of anger because um, it was an Ethiopian migrant worker had committed suicide. And these suicides weren't actually suicides. It's highly likely that they were actually killed by the families they were working for. Um, it sounds a bit crazy, but there's a whole story behind that. And my migrant worker domestic my migrant domestic worker project looks at. Um, but it was this moment of silence that really caught my eye. Um, and again, another moment of silence. So I started to notice these, and for me in this photograph, well, I, my eye is first drawn to that old man, and I'm thinking, what is it that he's thinking about as he's looking down on all these people? From his perspective, it must just be a sea of hands reaching up to you. And in that particular moment, it must be incredibly moving and harrowing, just trying to imagine what that must feel like. So it's these moments of silence that really start, and again, another moment of silence, it looks like a calm scene. And it's these moments of silence that kept appearing in my, in my work. And I wanted to explore a little bit more of that. So I ruminated over abstract things, like I started reevaluating color theory, I started reevaluating composition, all these sorts of things, and thinking about why I had taken these shots that I had done in the past, and what I wanted my sort of future projects to look like. I'd started thinking of photography in very new and nuanced ways. So this is some of the work that I ended up shooting um, in this weird period of lockdown. Um, it was exciting for me because, like I said, I was 16 when I first started photography, and like, for years I shot the most random stuff. I mean, like my remote control, there's photos of me, like I photographed like a ladybird on a magnifying glass, like the most absurd random stuff, but I enjoyed it. And I wanted to explore that. And I did the same thing. I found myself doing the same thing in the lockdown period. Um, obviously, we couldn't travel anywhere. Uh, so you were kind of stuck. You had to face whatever was in front of you at home or in your local area. Uh, and I started playing around with new kind of formats. So I started shooting in medium format film. I started shooting a 35 millimeter film. Uh, I started scanning stuff, you know, sticking them together, playing around in Photoshop. Uh, and I had a bit of, a, I had a whale of a time, to be honest. It was really nice re-exploring this, this um, re-exploring photography, to be honest. 
Again, these are my, these are, they knew they were being photographed, by the way. <laughs> it's the first thing everyone seems to ask me, like, do they know you were photographing? Yeah, I wasn't a creep. These are my friends uh, when, I, when I went to the south of France. Um, so again, just these quiet kind of moments. I started thinking a lot more before I was shooting rather than the classic photojournalistic kind of approach. And this is what I mean. I had a lot of fun shooting this. This was just ice like in the middle of winter and like a bowl that we have. Um, it's a family heirloom. It's quite an old, old bowl, I think. And uh, I could just see the similarities of the patterns of ice and mixing it around with that. And yeah, this was a more kind of recent, recent shot I did. So using 35 millimeter film, but also going a little bit back to that initial classic documentary style photography, which I really love. So it's still a little bit of that left in me. Um, but I've started thinking a lot about the direction, as I said, that I wanted to take my photography in. And I don't have any photos to show you for the new project that I've got planned. But just to give you an idea, um, it doesn't have a name yet, but it's called Dust. That's what I'm calling it for now. I know, very creative, right? Uh, and it's about, it's part, his, part historical and it's part fictional as well. And it's about the Sufi saint um, from a very, very long time ago. And it's, records say he's either born in southern Turkey or in Yemen. It's not really quite clear. But he made a journey over a long period of years across the world. Eventually, he ended up in Bangladesh. And he was told to spread Islam and to reach at a certain point. I won't give the whole story away because it's part of my project. But he, he, he was told to stop at a certain place and spread Islam there once he had found it. And eventually, he ended up settling in northeast part of Bangladesh, which is where my parents are from, in that particular region. And I'd heard about this story since I was a kid and been fascinated by it. There's so much mythology around his adventures that he took um, and the journey that he took. And my new project looks essentially at the journey that he took. So I want to photograph some of the countries as he traveled along them. And I want to make it part fictional. So it's going to contain, um, I don't know if any of you have seen, there's Ottoman depictions um, of paintings that they have, those miniature kind of style paintings. And sometimes they, they depict the prophet, um, which is not done in art. But the way that they do it is they cover his face with sometimes like a cloud or like kind of like floating dust kind of like that. And I want to look at similar kind of concept with this idea of the Sufi saint um, shot in medium format film. I'm going to go across a different, few different countries, but first, I mean, that's provided I get funding. Um, but I'm going to shoot the first part in Bangladesh uh, around October this year. I'm going to carry on a few projects as well, looking at the migrant domestic worker project in, uh, in Beirut. Um, the other part of what I wanted to talk about was just this idea of, of breaking down labels. Um, I'm not going to show you any more photos, don't worry. Uh, the idea of breaking down labels, because what I found when I first started photography was, you know, I had this real grappling with what am I? Am I a documentary photographer, photojournalist? Do I want to go into editorial work? And I really, really struggled to try and pinpoint a kind of voice, a photographic voice or a narrative that I felt was really reflective of who I am and my creative work. And at a certain point, also, on the other hand, I had this other career, you know, the more stable kind of career that my parents wanted me to do, uh, which was go down the route of politics and work in policy. And, you know, on the other hand, I wanted to do my photojournalism. You know, just go out there and do it, like, whatever, ignore the parents. And I really balanced the last few years. If you look at my CV, it's a bit like I was, I was completely crazy. Like, I'm doing six months of working for an NGO, humanitarian stuff. The other six months, I'd be in a refugee camp photographing work on this project. Um, and I couldn't decide what I was. And at a certain point, which I'm at now, I realized it doesn't actually matter. Like, no one cares about this stuff. The only thing that people care about is the work that you produce at the end of the day. When you approach an editor or a gallery person to do an exhibition, at the end of the day, the only thing they care about is the work that you've done to make sure it's solid, it's well-researched, it has purposeful meaning, and for you, yourself, that it's reflective of the kind of voice that you wanted to project. Um, that's so, so important. The rest of the stuff that everyone talks about, you know, am I a policy person, am I a photographer, that's just you. You've got to figure that out yourself, and you should be comfortable floating between the two. People, I think, when I started photography, and I wish I had told myself this when I started, would always be like, oh, you know, but you're not really a photographer because you go and 
you know, work for these NGOs and stuff on the side. And it's not, they have this idea that to be a photographer means you've got to live it, you've got to breathe it, this idea of a starving artist. And I think that's very overrated. And it's not in touch with reality today. Um, unfortunately, we live in a kind of society which the first problem in this capitalistic society is that it tells you that your main source of income, what you earn your money from, that's your profession. And if you really question that, it doesn't have to be the case. Look at some of the world's most famous creatives that have happened in the past. They've often done stuff to you know, provide, to have their rent paid for. Toni Morrison, she worked nine to five jobs, um, average jobs every single day, had hardly any hours, raised a family. She would wake up in the, if you look at interviews of her, it's very interesting. She would wake up in the early hours before the sun even rose to get her creative work done. And she wrote those books. There's another famous um, author who I really recommend everyone reads. It's called Nagib Mahfouz. He's one of my famous, he's one of my favorite authors of all time, Egyptian author, great guy. Um, if I was a smart creative, I would be thinking about those things. But I, I admit, I, I honestly don't. I, I just care about shooting it, and then I'll figure out the rest later. I don't really tend to envision what kind of, um, what kind of a format it will be in. Like, I know a lot of photographers I've worked with, they're like, oh, do you want this to be a magazine piece or an exhibit piece? Um, and I've never really thought along those lines. I kind of just want to shoot it. And then once I've got it and I edit it down, then try and figure out what the best uh, format for it to be presented in will be. The only exception is the recent project that I mentioned, the one in Bangladesh, looking at that historical, you know, the history of the Sufi saint. Um, I have started thinking along those lines. Um, but the only reason I've done that is because it's not a documentary, strict, kind, strict documentary kind of project. It's a bit more, it's my first foray into like the strictly art um, kind of world, which I'm very nervous about. Um, but I have started thinking more along those lines. And for that project, yeah, I'm envisioning um, maybe a gallery exhibition kind of piece. Um, and I was talking to Al about it as well, like incorporating some other elements too, like some sound and moving along those kind of lines, yeah. Any other questions? Lemzi. You made a distinction between your, like, your vocation and profession before. I think with creatives, a lot of the time, because our passion becomes something we end up getting paid for, or one of those two first things, do you, do you have like just a hobby that you do for fun outside of photography? Do I have a life outside of photography? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> No, <laughs> uh, no, 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 I, yeah, um, well, it was interesting because photography did start off as my hobby, and then it ended up being into this much deeper, more meaningful thing. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, it kind of turned up into its own career path, I guess, so I've got two like kind of careers going side by side in parallel to one another, but I do, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff that I do in my free time, I've got a lot of hobbies, <laughs> climbing, hiking, that stuff, I do have a life outside. I think, just to clarify, you, you do work as a civil servant. I do, yes. You, you've got yes. a nine-to-five that's separate from photography. I do, okay. yes, yeah. I do. Well. Um, so you find yourself quite often in situations where uh, people are obviously struggling and you know, maybe fleeing, maybe need help. Do you, do you find that um, you're, you're ever looked to to provide help? And if so, how do, you, how do you sort of balance that? How do you respond? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. I, I, you do find yourself in that situation. Um, in 2015, when I photographed the refugee stuff, I was really eye-opening. That was one of the main reasons why. It was the first time, you know, I'd just graduated. I hadn't had any experience working in the humanitarian sector. Um, and I really did feel that. Um, I just didn't feel it was enough photographing. Um, and you physically want to help yourself, you want to help people you know, get off the boats and things. And it was a weird time for me because what you don't see in those images, and you might have seen in the refugee images if you look back through the archives in 2015, like just in the press, you know, you'll see people coming off boats and things, but what you don't see is literally, and I found this really disgusting to be honest, is the throngs of photographers who had just stood there. It's almost like they're looking at it like a spectacle. And I remember one instance where this refugee, like he was a guy from Afghanistan and he fell off the boat, you know, and he was like sort of like struggling a little bit 
And then a photographer went to go and help and pick him up. And then another photographer was like, oh, why are you doing that? You know, you shouldn't be getting involved and stuff. And I remember there was set up like this whole mini kind of ethical debate in that weird heated moment. And I was like, of course you should go and help him. Like, surely you're a human being first before you go and help people, before you go and just photograph them. You want to go and help that person. And, uh, you know, I think it depends. Some photographers say you shouldn't get involved um, at the moment. But of my, for me personally, I mean, you know, I've never studied strict photography. I don't see these. There are, of course, ethical boundaries. But I think if someone needs help, you should go and help them first. Um, but I struggle with that a lot. And I, that's why I think what really gave me the, the motivation and the pull to also work towards in the humanitarian sector and the NGO work I did sort of a few years afterwards. But it is an on, it's, yeah, it's a real struggle, yeah. And there's no clear answer. All right, so Adib will hang back if anyone has any more questions afterwards. But another round of applause for Adib. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>